This PowerPoint presentation is on the later members of genus Homo, and this will correlate with chapter 11 and 12 in the Explorations textbook, and also correlate with chapter 15 and 16 in the lab manual. All right, so with later members of genus Homo, essentially Homo erectus and onward, we're going to see some major changes, um, essentially migration out of Africa, more sophisticated stone tool technologies, and expansion in cranial capacity, and with that more sophisticated behaviors such as control of fire, persistence hunting, symbolic expression, and language. So let's talk first about the migration out of Africa. So the first fossil hominins that we see out of Africa are the, De are the Demonisi hominins that date to about 1.75 million years ago. Uh, these are sometimes considered to be primitive examples of Homo erectus. Some paleoanthropologists give them their own genus and species, but most paleoanthropologists attribute these fossils to be primitive members of Homo erectus. So cranial capacity for these fossils is about 600 to 775 cc's. So that's a little bit lower than what you expect for Homo erectus, um, but also a little bit larger than what you expect with Homo habilis. Um, from the neck down, the postcranial anatomy, anatomy is relatively small. The shoulder anatomy is relatively primitive, so more similar to what you would see with Homo habilis. And also the stone tool technology is less sophisticated than other members of Homo erectus, so more old Awan type tools. Um, the shape of the mandible and the cranium more closely resemble other members of Homo erectus, which is why many paleoanthropologists attribute these fossils to Homo erectus, and many of the features of the lower limbs, such as the longer angled femur, the double arch to the foot, and the non-divergent non -divergent hallux, or non-opposable big toe. So essentially the big toe is in line, completely in line with the other toes. And there's a good section of a documentary that talks about the Demonisi hominins from PBS Becoming Human Part 2. This is a, the link to it. It's available here in this PowerPoint presentation as well as in this week's module. So here's one of those summary slides. Remember, these slides are just giving you a, a summary, essentially, of the important information that goes along with this particular fossil. So this species is generally considered to be Homo erectus. The dating is somewhere between 1.75 to 2 million years ago. The site is Demonisi, Georgia, which is at the gates of Europe. The features of this fossil, first example of genus Homo out of Africa in Europe. These fossils are found alongside the base level basic old one like choppers and scrapers. The brow ridge is slightly less robust than what you would see in other members of Homo erectus. The canine is slightly larger than what you would see in Homo erectus. However, the front of the skull shares more similar more similarities with earlier forms of genus Homo. However, overall, you're going to see a mosaic or a mixture of Homo habilis and Homo erectus like features. So remember that term mosaic simply means mixture of derived and primitive features or a mix of older and newer traits. All right, some of the key features, key anatomical features that we're going to see with Homo erectus and onward, we're going to see more ornathic or flatter faces, so less prognathism. Dentition is becoming more generalized and smaller, so that's due mainly to more generalized diet as well as the utilization of fire and sophisticated tools to process the food prior to consumption. So easiest way to understand this is think about eating a cooked vegetable versus a raw vegetable, like a cooked, cooked carrot versus a raw carrot. Obviously, it's much easier on your jaws and chewing muscles to consume a cooked carrot. So simply the control of fire to process food and make it softer and easier to consume um, over time led to anatomical and evolutionary changes in the dentition, the jaw, and the chewing muscles. By the time we get to Homo erectus, we consider these fossils and onward to be full-time or obligate bipeds. So this is in comparison to some of the earlier forms like the Australopithecines. The Australopithecines um, were essentially part-time bipeds. They were bipedal when on the ground, but also retained that ability to brachiate and be partially arboreal in the trees. But by the time we get to Homo erectus and onward, we see a commitment to full-time bipedalism. A wider geographic range, essentially migration out of Africa, and also more sophisticated stone tool technologies. 
Um, some of the anatomical features that we're going to see, additional anatomical features, we're going to see a jump in cranial capacity in comparison to what we saw with Homo habilis. So the range for Homo erectus is somewhere between about 8, 800 to 1200 cc's. The cranial vault, essentially the frontal region, what we know as the forehead region, the frontal region is long and low or receding. So behind the brow ridges here, it goes backwards instead of vertical like in modern Homo sapiens. Um, sagittal keel, so that term might look somewhat familiar. We learned about the sagittal crest with gorillas and orangutans and also with the robust forms of the Australopithecines. So I always say that you can see the crest, but you have to feel the keel. So it's essentially the keels in the same location as the crest. It's obvious, but it's not as obvious. You have to feel it to really to really um, determine whether it's there or not. Um, relatively smaller mandibles and smaller post posterior dentition, smaller premolars and molars. So again, that's due um, not only to a more generalized diet, but also utilizing fire and stone tool technologies to process food prior to consumption. So other features, we're going to see more sophisticated stone tool technologies uh, that these are going to be, Homo erectus utilizes what we call Achillean tools. So we'll talk more about that here in a moment. We see sophisticated, um, sophisticated tools, migration out of Africa for the first time, the control of fire, and also the inclusion of more meat in the diet. So not does it mean that they're exclusively consuming meat, Hominins in general are um, omnivores, they're going to consume a variety of food items such as vegetation, tubers, nuts, insects, fruits, uh, but by the time we get to Homo erectus we're going to see the inclusion of more meat in the diet, which some paleoanthropologists correlate this with expansion in cranial capacity because essentially the brain is a very metabolically expensive organ, especially a large brain. So that essentially means that we need high quality calories and access, reliable access to high quality calories in order to have and support this larger brain size. So the inclusion of meat in the diet could have potentially allowed for that more, um, more effective utilization of protein. Here's another one of those summary slides. So this is Peking man. This is one of the most famous fossils that is attributed to Homo erectus. Uh, this is from a site in China, the Zucadian site. This dates between about 300,000 to 600,000 years before present. Some of the features, we see a larger brain in comparison to Homo habilis, smaller posterior dentition, long, low cranial vault, that feature called the sagittal keel, relatively large pronounced super superorbital ridge or brow ridge, long legs and short arms. So again, commitment to bipedal locomotion, increased overall body size, increased tool use and more sophisticated tools. Um, this is Narakatomi boy. This is another fossil that is attributed to Homo erectus or Homo ergaster. Uh, date of this fossil is about 1.6 million years ago and it was found in Narakatomi, Kenya, in Eastern Africa. Uh, the paleoanthropologists that uncovered this fossil um, were able to uncover about 80% of the skeleton, so that's a pretty good portion. They were able to determine uh, locomotion by looking at relatively short arms and longer legs, and also longer angled femurs that indicate this commitment to bipedal walking and running. This particular individual would have been about eight to ten years old when he died, so kind of pre-adolescent male, and would have stood about six feet tall at adulthood. Cranial capacity for this fossil is about 900 cc's, so right within the range of what we expect with Homo erectus. Uh, the Achillean tools, so these are what we generally see associated with Homo erectus fossils. Um, the tools prior to this were the Oldowan tools that we saw associated with Homo habilis, and later members of the Australopithecines, like Australopithecus gari. Um, so the earliest examples of the Achillean tools date back to about 1.5 million years ago. So you may also see them called bifaces, hand axes, or cleavers. So they have this nice teardrop shape that would have fit neatly into the palm of your hand. So it is hypothesized that these tools were used predominantly for butchering meat and or digging up underground plant parts, such as tubers. They tend to be more standardized or more predictable in shape and size and structure than the Oldowan tools. And we see examples in Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. 
So these tools imply that Homo erectus was processing animal remains through scavenging and also possibly using these tools to dig up underground plants. All right, so after Homo erectus, we have Homo heidelbergensis. So Homo heidelbergensis is generally considered to be the common ancestor of Homo sapiens, us, and Homo neanderthalensis. Um, so these fossils are going to, again, be a mosaic. You're going to see some features that are features that you're familiar with with Homo erectus, such as the larger brow ridges, relatively long low cranial vault, although it's a little bit more rounded and vertical than you see with Homo erectus. And again, smaller premolars and molars. And we see another slight jump in cranial capacity. With Homo heidelbergensis, cranial capacity is really starting to approach modern day sizes at about 1200 to 1300 cc's. All right, so some of the behavioral traits. So with many Homo, Homo heidelbergensis fossils, we see intensive tooth wear on the anterior dentition, so the incisors and the canines. So this tooth wear is indicating that heidelbergensis may have been utilizing their anterior dentition while making clothing. So essentially using their teeth to hold the hide in place while using a tool to scrape out the sinew. Uh, they had relatively cooperative persistence hunting. So that term persistence hunting, if you remember some from the video we watched on Homo erectus, uh, persistence hunting essentially means that we're using our endurance to wear out our prey. Because essentially we're not faster than our prey, however we have greater endurance, uh, predominantly due to our ability to evaporatively cool. We are mainly hairless or furless, I should say. We do of course still have some hair, but it, we're not as furry as say a chimpanzee for example so that means that as we sweat and as that liquid cools on the surface of our skin it allows us to effectively cool down our bodies more effectively than a mammal that has fur um, so they also utilize a stone tool technology that's slightly more sophisticated than homo erectus we call these a mousterian or sometimes called middle paleolithic tool technologies and they're going to utilize what we call the Lavois technique. And one of the video clips we're going to watch this week is going to demonstrate, John Shea is going to demonstrate how we utilize the Lavois technique or how these hominins would have utilized it. Um, so here's some more of those summary slides that kind of give you the key points or the key features that are important with these fossils. So this is the Octoparca 5 fossil that we attribute to Homo heidelbergensis. This particular fossil was uncovered at a site called Cima de los Huesos, or Pit of Bones, in Atapuerca, Spain. So some of the features, you're going to see relatively heavy, pronounced brow ridges. So that's a feature they have in common with Homo erectus. Relatively wide nasal opening or nasal aperture. That's a feature they actually share with, um, the, with Homo neanderthalensis. So that's a cold adaptation. So again, you're seeing this mosaic of features. So this particular fossil is a mosaic of Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis-like features. And the mid-face region is relatively prognathic, so meaning that it's jutting out more to the side. If you were to look at this fossil from a lateral view, you would see that the mid-face is the part of the, of the face that projects the most. And cranial capacity is about 1,125 cc, so right within that range of what we expect for Homo heidelbergensis. Here's another one of those summary slides. This is another famous fossil that's attributed to Homo heidelbergensis. This is Broken Hill 1 or Rhodesian Man. Dating for this fossil is about 125,000 to 400,000 years before present, uncovered in Zambia in Africa. Um, this particular fossil, again, has a mosaic of features, but this time you're going to see a mosaic between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. So the features that are more common with Homo erectus, again, that really pronounced double arch brow ridge that we see also in the Homo erectus fossils. And then the features that are more common with Homo sapiens, we see a less prognathic, flatter face. If we were to look at this fossil from the side, from a lateral view, it would be um, less prognathic than what you see with Homo erectus. Um, also relatively larger brain size, right with, you know, almost within the range of what we see with Homo sapiens, right around 1300 cc's. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and pause here. So this is the end of part one of later members of genus Homo. And then the next, next presentation will be part two of later members of genus Homo.